Well, uh, I'd li also like to thank Rajiv for inviting me here to give this presentation. It's a great honor to, to come here to ICRSAT and present some of my work. And uh, you're probably wondering why I have the qualifier in there, public plant breeding programs, instead of just plant breeding programs. It's not that I have a problem or I don't care about private breeding programs. It's that I just happen to work with a lot of public plant breeders in terms of trying to implement genomic selection. And the scope of a public program, at least in the United States, is and the scale is quite a lot different than a private program. And so the questions that they're interested in might be a bit different than a private program. They might be interested in, in uh, using historical data. They might be interested in sharing data across different public breeding programs. And so that's what drives some of my research. So I have, um, I, I generally have broad interests in, in plant breeding. And I have projects, I actually run a, a, corn, a corn field program at Nebraska. And I have projects relating all the way from drought phenotyping uh, down to purely genomic prediction in multiple crops. And so as my title implied, I'm going to be talking about the genomic prediction side of my, my research today. So no disrespect to the other members of my group, but um, I'll be concentrating on the work of, of Ibrahim and Diego here. So we all know this. I don't need to repeat this, but this is the trend that's really driving the interest in genomic selection. Okay? And so to make a breeding program mostly, the most cost effective as possible into the future, we're going to have to maximize the use of, successful use of geno genotypic data okay, and hopefully minimize the amount of phenotypic data we need to collect in order to really leverage that genotypic data. And we don't have to talk about this, but you know, training population is the marker in the phenotypic data together. Train a model. Use that model on selection candidates that have been genotyped, not phenotyped. Make the predictions and select. No use for QTL mapping. No testing for significant markers. Again, um, large P, small n problem. You need to use fancier models to overcome this compared to just ordinary linear uh, least squares. And the reason we use genomic selection is because you know, it's been shown over and over and over again that for complex traits, it's, it's, uh, it's better than just simply using marker-assisted selection or a QTL mapping and uh, marker effect estimation approach. And another reason why we like genomic selection is because, and a reason why I think plant breeders like genomic selection is because they get these predictions and they can treat them just like phenotypes, just like they do in the ordinary, uh, you know, their breeding programs, their phenotypic breeding programs before. You get the prediction and they can use conditional formatting in Excel or and sort things the way they want to. They don't have to worry about specific individuals carrying specific marker alleles. Okay? So I think that's an attractive aspect of using a genomic prediction approach. So this is what the whole process looks like in full motion. Um, we have our selection candidates being genotyped and selections being made on genomic predictions alone. Uh, as often as we can, we try to phenotype individuals coming from that uh, pool of selection candidates so we can update the genomic prediction model. And I, I, I put this diagram up here to really uh, outline the questions I'm interested in and a lot of the questions that drive my research. Okay? So we can simply see those here. So, you know, what kind of marker platform do we use? What kind of uh, marker filtering criteria might we want to use? Uh, what kind of statistical model? Which lines do we advance from our selection candidates to the field for phenotyping? Okay, tra training population design, in other words. Uh, experimental design, we go from, when we go from phenotypic selection program to a genomic selection program, this changes how we're going to design experiments. Okay, when we have replication, hidden replication of alleles across individuals, we don't have to worry maybe as much about replicating uh, actual genotypes in the field, and we can just maybe just grow larger populations. So, and I, uh, Gary gave a nice plug for my 2013 paper. I'm not going to talk about this today, but I just referenced you to that G3 paper. And then, um, I guess that's about it. So it's, it's you know, real uh, straightforward answers to these common sense questions is what drives a lot of my research and what I'll be talking about today. Okay, I'm going to pound on this idea of, of uh, genetic relationships in terms of designing a training population a little bit more. And several people have already mentioned this. So, you know, we have a, this is just an arbitrary PCA plot up there illustrating some genetic variation in, in, in a breeding program or in a collection of accessions. And you have certain genetic, you have, you have maybe some population structure in your breeding program, and you have a certain genetic distance between these populations. Okay? And, uh, you might want to maybe combine uh, uh, data from individuals from different populations to form a single training population. So the question is, how, how diverse can I make these, uh, these how, how diverse of populations can I combine into a single training set? Okay. And then also, you might have a single individual you want to predict, and 
you know, you want to know maybe how far out uh, can I go in terms of genetic relationships between a single individual um, for making a prediction? And at what point maybe do I actually start hurting my predictions? So it doesn't make any sense to have these, these circles on this PCA plot because genetic distance isn't the same in, in one direction as is in the other, but I just use this for illustration. So, all right. So, you know, there are lots of reasons why decreasing genetic relationships or genetic covariance between individuals might result in a loss of information. For one thing, you know, there's purely statistical reasons. Once covariance parameters, variance parameters get down to close to zero, they become very hard to estimate and the estimates become a lot flimsier and introduce a lot more noise into the, the model. All right, but there are a lot of genetical reasons why information sharing is going to degrease, decrease. One would possibly be epistasis. So you could, it's possible that there are QTL allele by genetic background effects, okay, where the effects are going to change from population to population. Another probably more common situation is that between subpopulations that have, are genetically divergent from one another, you, you could have different marker QTL linkage phases. Okay? So in population, uh, in population one here, we have the big M and the big Q, Q uh, alleles linked to one another. And in population two, it's just the opposite. So marker effect in population one is going to be uh, the opposite of what it should be for accurate predictions in population two. Okay? And then another reason would be that perhaps the loci generating genetic variation for your trait of interest are not the same across subpopulations. I don't see any negative consequences uh, with this in terms of affecting prediction accuracy, but clearly if this is going on, you're going to have a decline in prediction accuracy as you go across more divergent populations. So a couple of years ago, I uh, just playing around a little bit in some barley data. Uh, in, this, in this barley data, we have about 1,200 or so polymorphic markers. And we have uh, two clear subpopulations uh, generated by uh, lines coming from the University of Minnesota and North Dakota State barley breeding programs. And if, if, if you zoom out and look at all the barley germplasm in North America, these two populations are very closely related to one another. Okay? They're the most closely related uh, germplasm sets there are in North America. But if you zoom in, you can see clear population structure. Okay? And uh, in addition to other questions we wanted to answer, we're interested in, in uh, investigating the ability or the benefits of combining data across multiple breeding populations for making predictions. And what we found was that, you know, when you want to predict in one population, let's say the Minnesota population, you get pretty good prediction when you use just Minnesota lines. When you use North Dakota lines to predict Minnesota lines, prediction, you know, goes way down, as others have mentioned. Uh, when you combine the two populations to double your training population size, you don't really get any benefit. So it's like there's no information at all coming from the North Dakota germplasm in terms of predicting the Minnesota germplasm. Okay. So I wanted to dig into this a little bit deeper and uh, more carefully examine relationships between prediction accuracy and genetic relationships okay, in designing a training population. And ultimately, I would not say I'm here yet, but the ultimate goal of this is design an uh, intelligent way to design and train a population. Uh, leveraging relationship information. So to, to you know, start poking around on this problem, uh, I, I've been using what I, would, what I think is a very, very nice data set. And this comes from, again, that Barley uh, data that I just presented a couple slides ago. But this, this program has been advanced to generation. Okay? And this has been done uh, by Kevin Smith at the University of Minnesota. And this is a collaboration um, between us, dating back to my postdoc at Cornell. So what this is, is we have uh, 384 parents from the University of Minnesota and North Dakota State breeding programs. Uh, these are phenotyped across four years. And then what Kevin did was he took selected lines based on predictions from the Minnesota program and the North Dakota program, and he made crosses with, you know, between Minnesota lines and Minnesota lines and crosses between North Dakota lines and North Dakota lines, and he made crosses, you know, uh, inter-program crosses, okay? So Minnesota by North Dakota crosses. And then from these crosses, uh, he derived about uh, 100 F4 derived progenies from each of these crosses. Okay, so we have the Minnesota by Minnesota progenies, Minnesota by North Dakota progenies, North Dakota by North Dakota progenies. Okay? So this is my, my validation population, and these are my, this is basically my training population. And the really nice thing about I mean, so I, I know we only have these, so we went from uh, those 1,200 polymorphic SNPs in this germplasm down to only 384. Because at the time, 
it was really easy. The, the, the thing to do at the time was to you know use a Golden Gate Golden Gate assay, and 384 SNPs was cost effective, and we determined that's really all we needed to make uh, to, to get accurate predictions in this germplasm. So that's why we have 384 SNPs. I know it's not very sexy, which you need to type in by sequencing, but I think it does the job. So we went. To, uh, where was I going with that? So we, we made. So so the nice thing about this germplasm is that you know. I'm not working with some sort of diversity panel with all kinds of structure in it. I'm working with real breeding lines from a, a breeding program. So I have the structure in this as a breeding program has. Okay? And these progenies here, my validation population, is one generation removed from my training population, just like what you'd want to do in genomic prediction. Okay? We're interested in making predictions across generations. So I, I would say I, got the, I have the best validation population that I've, that I've seen so far. Okay, so this is what the genetic relationships look like. This is the realized relationship matrix calculated with those 384 SNPs. And uh, we have our training populations and our validation populations. And so as you'd expect, the Minnesota by Minnesota progenies are more closely related to the uh, Minnesota training population. And then the interpopulation, the interprogram crosses here have uh, diverse relationships. And uh, I should point out that this, this uh, realized relationship matrix is calculated by the method of of Jeff Endelman, um, published in 2012. It's part of the RR Bluff package. And so, you know, to start to investigate, others have done this, but to start to investigate the relationship between prediction accuracy and relationship, I took a sliding window approach. So I took all my training population, and I defined my validation population as being only the Minnesota by Minnesota progenies. And then I took the training population and I ranked every individual in that training population according to his average relationship with the validation population. And then I took the first 200 individuals and I trained a model and I predicted. And I took the next 200 individuals and I trained a model and predicted. And I incremented this. I didn't take the next 200. I incremented the sliding window by uh, 10, by increments of 10. Okay? So I get this nice spectrum of relationship between my, my two populations. And then I can look at the relationship between prediction accuracy, just expressed here as a correlation between uh, the predicted and the observed. This is actually what I like to call predictive ability. Okay, prediction accuracy to me has a strict definition as being the correlation between the true breeding value and the genomic or the estimated breeding value. Okay, if we just look at this, this correlation between the predicted and observed, this is the predictive ability. And uh, so it's just, you don't, don't worry about the absolute numbers here because it's not corrected for, by, for the heritability of the validation population. So this is extremely biased downward. I'm just interested in the relative values here. So you see this nice relationship, clearly, as you go to uh, less and less related populations, prediction accuracy just goes off a cliff, okay? Same for North Dakota population. For some reason, we're getting this weird uh, quadratic response in the North for, for FHB resistance. So I didn't point out the trait, so if Don concentration, FHB rating, uh, fusarium head blight rating, and uh, uh, plant types, okay? So we have this going on. This might be what John was mentioning in terms of, you know, uh, maybe this trait is affected by lack of diversity in the training population. I'm not sure. All right, and then when I go to try to predict the interpopulation or the interprogram crosses, uh, I have very poor luck overall, okay? And then this relationship between uh, genetic relationship and prediction accuracy seems to disappear, okay? So I, there's, something, there's something going on here that is worth investigating further, but I haven't done that, and so I'm not going to talk very much about this validation population. All right, so we know that this has been published uh, before Don talked about this. Uh, there's a paper in genetics not that long ago of uh, Christian Riedelsheimer, the first author, looking at this in biparental populations. Another one in genetics, Vientes et al. had looked at this. And so this is anything particularly new. But what I wanted to know is that okay, at what point, does this, you know, as I build my training population, is it possible that actually adding increasingly unrelated individuals is going to start to bring my prediction accuracy down? Okay. So I started to look at this using a similar approach. I took all my training population individuals, ranked them according to the average relationship between them and my validation population. Okay. And I took the 10 most closely related individuals, trained a model, predicted, and then added the next 10, the next 10, the next 10, until I got all the way up to 700 and some. And I plotted that out here. Okay, with my correlation, training population size, and so, and then on the, on the top here, I have the average relationship of the next 10 that are being added to the training population, okay? And then uh, this color here represents the proportion of lines in a total training population that come from one of the original 
uh, you know, Minnesota or North Dakota sets. Okay? So you can see that the composition of the training population changes as I you know, add individuals according to relationship. And yes, it took me way too long to code this in R than what it's probably worth, but I have little kids and I don't do anything Saturday nights anyway. Um, so you can see now, at some point, uh, as we add individuals here that are increasingly unrelated to the validation population, uh, we actually start to trend downward. Okay? Uh, you can see the R squares are pretty good for these, these fits, and so we're trending downward. We're actually possibly hurting our prediction model by adding these unrelated individuals. Okay, As so we take those points away, because we have a good R squared here, so we can more clearly see the trends. This is what the situation looks like for Minnesota by Minnesota. This is what the situation looks like for the North Dakota by North Dakota validation population. Okay. So, seems to be, I, I would say the answer, you know, it's not a real strong effect, but I, I, would, I would, I think I can conclude that um, we are, as we start adding unrelated individuals, we're actually starting to reduce our prediction accuracy. And the prediction accuracy at least plateaus, and so you be wise if you start to determine some sort of cutoff in terms of adding individuals. All right, so then the next thing I wanted to look at was um, some different schemes in terms of, in terms of uh, designing a training population. So we have, of course, you can just randomly select individuals to design a training population. We can take this approach that I just described where I, I rank individuals and select them based on their average relationship to the validation population. Or you can get really wild and you can start designing custom training populations for every single individual in your validation population. Okay, so what I do here is I take every individual in the validation population and I rank everybody in the training population according to this relationship with that individual in the validation population and then I select a custom training population for that single individual. I just build the model, uh, R or Bluff model, and I predict the genetic value of that single individual. Okay, so you have you know, the number of models I'm building here, number of training populations I have is equal to the number of individuals in my validation population. And then we can do this on a family basis as well, just uh, design, design it around families. So you can see that, you know, I thought, I thought this might work and I thought it'd be pretty cool if, you know, genomic selection went the way of custom training populations for everybody you're going to predict. But it wasn't to be true. Um, there's really no big difference between taking the average and the individual specific. Okay. Same for North Dakota. Uh, for the most part, and um, you see, but though you know, taking these different approaches is better than just the random approach. Okay. All right, so you know, this this is easy to do because in this situation, I know what the phenotypes are, so I can look at the prediction accuracies and I can decide what is optimum and that kind of stuff. But in real life, of course, you never actually, you never see these individuals in the field, so you don't know what the prediction accuracy is going to be. You don't know where to make that cutoff. So. So, you know, can we establish some sort of uh, standard criteria for making that cutoff? And one thing that comes to mind and uh, is this, this statistic that's called the correlation of R. Okay? And what this represents here is the persistence of LD phase across subpopulations. So we, if we have, you know, some sort of a genetic distance here related, represented by this arrow, uh, we have, you know, individuals here that you, know, you have basically have the linkage phase here change as individuals become more and more, or populations become more and more diverged, okay? And the nice thing about this is that it takes into account both the divergence of the populations and the marker density, okay? You can have really diverged populations, but if you have really high marker density, you're still going to have good correlation of R between adjacent markers. You have really closely related populations, if you have really low marker density, you could have low correlations of R between adjacent markers, okay? Or adjacent loci, I should say. Is really this this uh, correlation, this linkage phase between the marker and the QTL that we're talking about. <clears throat> so I can use the markers to sort of give an idea about the correlation of R between different populations. Okay, and you can calculate this pretty in a pretty straightforward manner. Uh, I won't go through it. It's uh, shoot, I can't see the guy the first author genetics paper in 2008 that sort of laid this sum this out. Um, It'll come to me. Anyway, so you can calculate this pretty easily. Okay? So you get this correlation of R, represents consistent LD phases between adjacent markers, between populations. Uh, and, oh, here it is, Deruch 2000 at all, uh, at all 2008. So what they showed was that you have this marker distance, uh, or this distance between loci or markers in this case, between, uh, for different populations. 
You can see that this correlation of R here declines with genetic distance between markers. You can see that it declines more rapidly or less rapidly uh, between different types of populations that are, are more or less diverged. Okay? So the, I think these are Herfordfords from the Netherlands versus Herfordfords from Australia. Apparently are pretty closely related, so the correlation of R is pretty high across a large range of genetic distance. On the other hand, Angus from Australia, I think, and Jersey from New Zealand, I believe, uh, are quite diverged, and so the correlation of R between adjacent loci rapidly drops off. Okay. So what's it look like in this barley situation? Uh, you know, as we'd expect, you look at the relationship between additive relationship between the training population and the validation population versus correlation of R. You know, we have uh, pretty much what you'd expect: diverge uh, population. This is using a sliding window approach again. Okay, so. Diverse populations here have low correlations of R. Closely related populations have high correlations of R. Okay. So can we somehow leverage this to decide uh, who to include in the training population and who not to include in the training population? So I did some of this. And rather than you know, calculate the correlation of R between whole populations, I calculated what I'm going to call individual specific correlation of R. I can calculate the correlation of R between any single individual and the average of the population. And I can use this. You know, rank individuals according to this, just like I did using the additive relationship, okay? And select my training population. And here I'm using that same sort of that same sliding window approach that I used before, where we're going up in training population, adding individuals with higher individual correlations of R to the validation population. Uh, and you can see that, you know, the, you, you can see that you at least plateau at some point, and in some cases you start to go trending downwards in terms of prediction accuracy. And in, in, in orange here, I highlighted that region where you at least plateau or start to trend downwards. And it looks like you know, that, that highlighted region, the top axis here is the individual correlation of R between the individuals being added and the validation population. So you can see that you know, it's right around 0 to 0 0.05, something like that. Okay, so that might be one criteria to use. And so I need to continue to look into this uh, using different populations with higher marker densities uh, and uh, maybe compare this use of individual correlation of R, which is good for just you know, pairs of adjacent loci with some more sophisticated uh, multi, multi locus LD measures, okay, like haplotype sharing or something like that. Really didn't have the marker density in this data set to justify going into you know, like haplotype sharing links, things like that, to look at this. So um, there's possibly some potential there. So that's what I have to say about that. I want to uh, address a couple other things here before I finish up. Other questions that I outlined at the beginning of the talk, and one of them is the marker platform. Okay. It seems to be that people have concluded already that genotyping by sequencing is the way to go and does just as well as high-density SNP information. So, but I don't think that's quite conclude that yet. Um, at least I didn't at, when, at the time when we started to pursue this project. So here's a small project here in collaboration with Steven Benziger and Edward Akinov and Jesse Poland, where uh, a three, population of 300 winter wheat lines from the Great Plains in the United States were phenotyped uh, across a couple different years, a couple different locations. And all these lines were genotyped with both the 92K Illumina SNP assay, okay? and also they're genotyped, uh, thanks to Jesse, using this two-enzyme two GBS approach. Okay? So, Expensive genotyping, cheap genotyping. And then a 10 cross-validation was applied to see if there's any sort of difference in prediction accuracy. So again, let me remind you that there are reasons why GBS might not work as well as high-density SNP arrays. Okay? And one of those is that there's a huge amount of missing data. There are markers, in this case, with uh, up to 80% missing data. And uh, although, the you know, like... It's been pointed out there's less ascertainment bias, and so we're, you know, we're capturing those minor alleles with rare allele frequency. So this is the GBS situation versus the 92K uh, select situation. Very little missing data. Okay? So messy data, clean data. How do they do in terms of prediction accuracy? Oh, well, this, this is the marker numbers after we filter by minor allele frequency and percent missing value, uh, less than 50%. We have 28,000 SNPs with the iSelect 92K and 20,000 GBS. Okay. So the result is real simple. Um, here, I just want to point out, or I want you to concentrate on the position of this blue bar, this dark blue bar, with respect to everything else. And you'll see that the GBS 
uh, based on a couple different filtering, filtering criteria, does at least as well uh, and, and often better than the SNP array. So, so uh, I think that I think this is this is the most thorough study on this in terms of of, of a good marker density on the SNP side of things is, is what's been done. Yet. Okay, so GBS seems to work just fine, and as we all know, GBS gives us a ton of markers, probably more markers than we oftentimes more markers than we need, more markers than we know what to do with, and so. Is there any sort of filtering criteria that we can use to help us uh, increase our prediction accuracies? So to answer this, I'm, inter I'm going to introduce another project in soybean. So in here we have 300 lines, GBS. Okay. We have uh, traits, grain yield, plant type, maturity date, uh, at least four locations for each line, good, good entry mean heritability, so high quality phenotypic information. These lines were, as I said, GBS at uh, Institute of Genomic Diversity at Cornell. And there are 219,000 possible SNPs that we could call. And again, we took a replicated cross-validation approach to answer some basic questions in terms of genomic prediction in this program that uh, George Graff, the UNL soybean breeder, wants to begin to implement. This is what the genotypic data looks like. This is a nice uh, figure provided by Katie Jaime, Katie Haima at Cornell. And, um, you know, I just want to point out there's a lot going on in this figure. I just want to point out that in this GBS data, we pretty much see what we'd expect, uh, higher tag counts near the ends of the chromosomes, okay, and therefore more SNPs at the ends of the chromosomes and this, and then, then near the centromeres. Uh, and then the missing data is in the inside here, and so we have uh, more missing data towards the centromeres and less missing data on the chromosome ends. As we'd expect, we've seen this in other pictures presented at this workshop. And then also want to point out that this black here is the, the minor allele frequency of all those SNPs. We have some chromosomes that uh, look a little less diverse in, in this population than other chromosomes. You know, I don't think there are any real implications for genomic prediction here, but it's just a good characterization of the distribution of marker variation in this population. Okay, so absolute SNP number uh, with GBS. We have, you know, if we take a a cutoff here with less than 5% missing data. Uh, we have 16,000 SNPs that have at least a minor loop frequency of 0 0.05. If we use all the miss, all the SNPs, you know, up to 80% missing data, we have 52,000 SNPs that are polymorphic in this population. Okay, so huge number of SNPs to work with. And the question is, is there a subset of these SNPs based on some sort of missing data criteria or miss, minor loop frequency that works better than all the SNPs? And what we have here is just the, again, the predictive ability plotted by the minor loop frequency of the SNPs and the percent missing data. And so what uh, Diego Harkin did this project, and what he did is he, he basically just filtered, he created all types of, of marker sets filtered by various these, these missing data criteria and minor loop frequency criteria and uh, did a cross-validation for each one. And you'll see that the lines are very flat, which means that selecting on minor loop frequency didn't really make much of a difference. And you'll see that the lines are very close together, meaning that selection on my, uh, missing data, filtering on missing data, didn't make much of a difference either. Okay? So, and then if we zoom in, zoom in on the minor loop frequencies of uh, 0.06 to 0.1, and look, you know, we see the same pattern as we saw before. But then if we, we compare just a naive imputation to a random forest imputation, we see that we get a slight boost. Okay? So we maximize prediction accuracy here when we impute and we include all the data, even the markers that have 80% missing data, which sounds absurd, but doesn't really matter. It's true. How much time do I have? Oh, not much time. So um, I mentioned statistical models, and uh, John pointed this out as well. But I would say that myself and my students and postdocs have spent, have, have burned a massive amount of electricity doing lots of cross-validation and lots of fa fancy Bayesian models that take lots of time. Uh, and, you know, just to get figures that look like this. So it's a bit disappointing, but I would say there are blup, gblup, and in my experience works just as well as anything else. And there are some theoretical reasons why that's so. Gene Ola had a nice paper this last year on this subject. But, you know, to, to beat this a little bit more, we looked at modeling epistasis in the soybean population. Okay? So we took a genome-wide approach to modeling epistasis, and uh, there are a couple different ways to do this. One's Correct, I believe, and one's incorrect, but I think to give you a similar answer. 
So we have, you know, a basic G-bluff model here, and this is the prediction accuracy using a tenfold cross-validation, about 0.6. This would be a model that includes the simple Hadamard product between the G matrix. Okay? And this is a model, this KAA here, kinship, is a additive by additive relationship matrix that was derived and shown by Shisong Zhu here just this last year. Okay, so this is the correct way to model an additive by additive relationship matrix. This Hadamard product here is sometimes used, but it's incorrect. This, this goes back to, if you think about, you know, back to introductory, introduction of quantitative genetics, you can express the covariance between two individuals in terms of you know, twice the coefficient of co-ancestry times additive genetic variance plus, and then the additive part is, is uh, twice the coefficient of co-ancestry squared, okay, times additive by additive variance. So you might think that the model that you would just take the, the simple element by element product of those two matrices, but in fact that's correct because, you know, we often forget that those assumptions in classical quantitative genetics assume that all the loci are independent, and that's not the case. So um, this is the correct way to do that. But you'll see that, again, you know, fair, somewhat disappointing. Modeling that epistatic effect uh, didn't really improve things as compared to just doing GPLUB. So that's about all I have. Just three simple conclusions. GBS works well. So, uh, and then if you have GBS data, use everything. Impute. Don't worry about filtering markers. And pay special attention to genetic relationships. And this individual correlation of R here. Uh, has some potential in terms of design, deciding who to include in your training population and who not to. Uh, so I'd like to thank my crew, my students, acknowledgments, and I guess that's about uh, all we have time for. So thank you for your attention.